welcome to our Starting and Running an Investment Club uh, webinar series from iClub Central. Tonight, our topic is when to sell a stock from your investment club portfolio. Each month during our webinar, we take a look at a particular topic uh, related to starting and running a successful investment club. Uh, we'll t a special emphasis is placed on our tools, such as our myiclub.com suite of club accounting and operations tools. Uh, and our team of experts is standing by to help you with other questions and comments that you may have about starting and running your investment club. But tonight we're gonna to focus on the portfolio management tasks that your club must undertake as it manages a portfolio of stocks uh, and possibly other securities uh, that you are investing in for the benefit of your investment club members. Now, all successful investing uh, in my view, begins with a discipline. Uh, and it's, uh, I once heard a, an experienced market trader uh, comment that it's better to have discipline than conviction. Uh, and this goes to the point that if you have a framework for selecting stocks, buying stocks, uh, holding stocks and selling stocks, uh, if you stick with that framework, you're gonna be more successful than reacting to the market than uh, acting on a conviction or a belief or a suspicion that a stock may perform well. But if you have a set of rules in place that you can analyze the fundamentals of a stock that will help you know uh, how to select the stocks and manage your portfolio, provide that basic framework. The stock selection guide that Better Investing has developed is a great tool for helping you to determine what stocks to buy and how much to pay. Uh, however, the task of selling is one that's a little more complicated and not covered by the stock selection guide uh, to the same extent as on the buy side. So from our perspective, it's a, a good idea to codify the rules and the understanding in your investment club about when you're actually going to sell a stock from your portfolio. And if we look at what the one of the great investors of all time has to say about when is the right time to sell a stock that you're holding. Uh, Warren Buffett famously said, it's best to buy low and never sell. Of course, if you're Warren Buffett, that's easier said than done. Um, but for the rest of us, we can benefit from it. And ironically, uh, in the last week, it has come out that Warren has made some sale transactions. Uh, we were uh, I'll be very interested to hear his rationale. Uh, I think I understand why he is unloading some financial stocks and some airline stocks, but uh, for many of the companies that he owns, uh, he has been an owner of those companies for decades uh, with a very long-term perspective. He's not making decisions based on short-term perspective, but on the long-term, even as he is in his 80s, uh, still looking ahead to the long-term potential of the stocks that he is buying. If we look at another uh, investing guru, Philip Fisher, author of Common, Common Stocks and Uncommon Profits, wrote that if the job of buying a stock has been done properly, the time to sell is almost never. His perspective is that if we take advantage of the almost unlimited upside to the economy and the company growth, uh, that we can simply uh, find good companies that are growing uh, a little bit faster than the overall economy, that are keeping up with the market, and we can hold on to them as long as those trends remain in place, as long as those companies are successful. Here's a graph of the stock market going back to 1871 with an exponential uh, growth trend line that's indicated there. So we see periods of outperformance where the market bumps up and comes back down, but that trend line uh, maintains its upward trajectory. Uh, and that is certainly going to be the case uh, as we continue, despite everything that's happening in the market, uh, in 2020, uh, over the long term, we expect that the economy will recover and resume its upward trajectory, uh, and the same is true of the broader stock market. So if you're not Warren Buffett or Philip Fisher or any number of other gurus, uh, selling is something that you're going to become acquainted with, no matter what your perspective is, no matter whether uh, you are successful or not. Uh, by and large, with your stock selections, there will be times where selling a stock will be required. 
Better Investing has talked about a rule of five that applies to the stocks that you select using their stock selection guide methodology. The rule of five states that of every five stocks that you purchase, one out of every five stocks will outperform phenomenally well. It's gonna be the stock that you brag about and let everyone else in your club know that you were the one who brought that stock to uh, their attention, tell your family and friends, um, and that will be the superstar. Three out of every five stocks will perform just about as expected, which means they'll uh, perhaps uh, move up in line with the market, perhaps a little bit better than the market. Uh, every month when your club meets, those stocks won't have very much to report at all. Earnings are up, revenues are up, stock price is up, everything is moving forward. Um, it's a sort of boring success. Uh, and that's four out of every five stocks. That's an 80% success rate if the rule of five applies to your club. But one out of every, every five stocks is going to underperform. Um, often this is due to unpredictable circumstances that you just couldn't have predicted. No one predicted uh, a pandemic this year. So if some stocks are not performing as well due to the pandemic related uh, uh, circumstances, that goes without saying that's something that you couldn't have figured out uh, in advance. But investors do need to have a, a framework and guidance to know when to sell the underperforming companies. And that's where uh, thinking this through uh, with your club members can help you to be a little bit better. We have problems because we're human uh, and humans have various cognitive biases that make us uh, make terrible decisions whenever money uh, is uh, is on the table. Um, we This is one reason why uh, pe people become addicted to gambling because they, uh, they get addicted to the winning concept and they can't, uh, they can't quit. They, they, they love the concept of taking home uh, all the money, uh, raking in the chips. Uh, they can't separate reality from uh, the fiction that they've built in their heads. Um, there are also all sorts of other reasons. Um, research that academics have done actually show that individual investors do a pretty good job of understanding good companies, understanding quality, knowing when to buy stocks when they're reasonably priced. Um, so we do those things very well, but we're really terrible at the selling decision. Um, often, individuals sell too soon. Uh, and when you sell too soon, you're leaving money on the table. You're leaving uh, profits and gains that you could have earned, uh, but you sold too soon or you sell too often. Uh, you take advantage of the rules that Wall Street has taught its brokers to convey to customers uh, that uh, trip up our attempts to be successful investors. Uh, and we are selling much, much more often than we need to, generating higher taxes and, and costs, or we sell too late. We hold on to the losers, even as they become worse and worse with the false hope that eventually they will recover uh, and turn around. No one's a perfect seller, but everyone can improve. And it all starts with not uh, neglecting the problem. Uh, putting your head in the sand won't make the problems with your companies go away. And this is the, uh, a key uh, bias that you should recognize uh, about yourself and about uh, everyone in your club uh, likely suffers from this tendency to ignore the losses, ignore the downside and focus on the upside uh, and not take action because that validates the mistake. As long as you don't take action, there's a chance things will come around. It's much better to fess up, deal with it, move on. Um, and so in some ways, uh, I would suggest that many investment clubs uh, become too too attached to the principle of long-term buy and hold investing when they really need a little more dynamic approach to their portfolio, uh, trading in stocks that have better prospects than some of the stocks they're currently holding when things aren't working out or when there is uncertainty. So here are my tips on when to sell a stock from your investment club portfolio. Uh, and the first of all, uh, I suggest that you don't sell only to take a profit. 
uh, Peter Lynch wrote that you won't improve your investing results by pulling out the flowers and watering the weeds. And this is what happens when you go out to your garden. Uh, if you cut off all of the, the, the flowers, the blooms from your garden, you're left with nothing but, but headless stalks and weeds. Um, it's much better to weed your garden, get rid of the undesirable plants, get rid of the things that are not contributing to your garden, and, and nourish the, uh, the flowers that are blossoming well. Um, the, this whole strategy of selling to lock in a profit is something that Wall Street has, uh, has taught over the years because it's a great way to generate commissions and make customers feel good because they're locking in a profit, that sounds great. But you have to remember that when you lock in a profit by selling a stock, you end up selling the best performers out of your portfolio. If you took this advice to heart, you would be selling all of your best performing companies because they earned a profit, then you would be held, holding on to companies that were underperforming. Generally, from Better Investing's perspective and the documents that they've created over the years, their experience that they teach is that long-term investors should let the winners ride, focus more on the losers and let the winners' gains just accumulate in your portfolio. Number two, don't sell due to panic or market conditions. What happens in the broader market doesn't affect the fundamentals of your company. Now, what happens in the broader economy might certainly affect your company's fundamentals, but the bear market and the bull market history uh, in the U.S. Uh, points to one true fact, which is that all bear markets end, all recessions end. Our perspective should be to focus on fundamentals, look at market corrections as potential buying opportunities. Uh, last month, uh, when we talked about uh, how clubs were faring in the market, uh, I did a poll and by and large, uh, more than two thirds of clubs were holding steady or looking to buy stocks uh, with the market uh, moving down uh, in overall value with many of their stocks falling in price. Uh, there was a sense that this is a buying opportunity. Yes, some stocks are not gonna perform well in the next six to 18 months, right? Uh, airline stocks, uh, hotel stocks, travel-related stocks. There are going to be a lot of retail companies like the bankruptcy that was announced this week uh, or that, that expected from J.C. JCPenney. Uh, a lot of bricks-and-mortar retailers are probably going to have a difficult time recovering from being closed for a couple of months during uh, the first and second quarters of 2020. But that's not to say that the that uh, we can blame J.C. Penney's problems on the pandemic. They've been having problems for quarter and quarter and quarter, something like uh, 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 15 of the last 20 quarters. They've been losing money. I mean, this is not a, a successful kind of company that we look for in our portfolio. So we can go through our portfolio and understand that yes, the economy may have an impact, um, and uh, it becomes a um, it becomes a matter of how risk adverse really are you. Uh, if you're very aggressive, um, yes, maybe this is a buying opportunity for Delta Airlines where it, it, the stock price won't get too much cheaper. If you're moderately aggressive, maybe we're going to wait a little bit. Um, if you feel like you don't want to take on that much, much risk, then there are plenty of other opportunities in the market that you can find that will match your particular and your club's particular risk profile. If we look at the bear market history, we've talked about this um, in the past. Uh, bear markets happen um, over, since 1929, bear markets have happened on average every 3.4 years. Here we are in 2020, our last bear market ended 11 years ago. So we are in uncharted territory in some ways uh, because our bull markets have been getting longer and longer um, and the bull market gains are getting bigger and bigger. The bear markets tend to uh, last uh, uh, less, uh, uh, shorter amounts of times. The present bull is not 4.2 uh, years old. The present bull 
is 4.2 days old, I think, or uh, four weeks old since uh, the um, um, since the market rebounded from its late March uh, uh, decline. But the average frequency of bull markets since 1929 has been every 3.4 years. Again, so we are in uh, uh, a period of time where there's uh, I, whether or not we are in a bear market right now is less of an issue to me, uh, and uh, I don't feel it's necessary that we define it. I certainly believe that we are in a down market uh, or potentially a sideways market for some time, that the, the worst may not be yet to come. Uh, we don't know that. Um, certainly, I wouldn't expect the stock market to deliver you know, another 20 or 30% gain in 2020. It's already bounced back more than 30% since the decline. Um, and that's on a lot of optimism and a lot of hope that things are going to uh, come around again. Whether that happens, again, you can decide on what your own take is, but I don't think it's necessary to know that from our strategy. What is necessary to remember is that bear markets always end, right? And so this one will too, this sideways market will end. We will return to normalcy at some point. The recession will end. It's likely to go on for at least three or four quarters. Uh, so the entirety of 2020 and into 2021, from my view, we would expect some decreased economic activity. Uh, I just don't see how we're going to get back to where we were uh, anytime in the next couple of months. I think there's going to be, even if the economy, quote, reopens, there are going to be pockets of people who are not going to be going out with the same frequency, uh, who are going to be a little more cautious about the, the time that they spend in public, uh, shopping, uh, eating out, dining out. So I think there's, it's going to take some time before things uh, get back to a state of normalcy. Anyway, we can talk about that. We've talked about it in the past and we'll continue to address it. But what's important to remember is um, that uh, if we do have a sideways market going forward, again, this doesn't mean that your stock is not performing well on a fundamental basis. Stock prices don't go up linearly. Uh, stock prices move up in spurts. And so it may only be a couple of days out of the entire trading year in which a successful company sees its price jump up a couple of percentage points, uh, and then it reaches that 15, 10 to 15 to 20% gain for the year that might mark that company as being successful relative to the indexes uh, in the last couple of time, uh, last couple of years, or a last couple of uh, months and quarters. Uh, the Key is that in the long term, earnings drive stock prices. In the short term, all sorts of things drive, drive stock prices up or down. But in the long term, it's earnings that count. It's profitability that counts. In the short term, uh, it, everything's up for grabs. So that's why our approach is to focus on capital appreciation driven by the growth of the underlying business. Um, during a bear market, companies may continue to make products that sell, they may continue to be profitable, but their prices uh, relative to the, that those earnings uh, are decreased. And so that gives us an opportunity to buy those stocks at a more reasonable level than we would have uh, prior to the market sell-off. But one of the things that, that often comes up in an investment club is that you buy a stock and then for months, uh, the, uh, the price just doesn't seem to change very, month, very much at all. And someone will complain that this stock hasn't done anything for the club. Uh, and again, that is taking the short-term view uh, and it, it is true that the lack of price movement could indicate that, that the market might be nervous about the stock or knows of potential problems. Um, so the, the right thing to do is to reevaluate, to determine the impact of the stock and if the stock should be sold. Uh, it may be the case that, that uh, a stock that it doesn't seem to have er, a price momentum, that doesn't seem to be uh, responding to the uh, the 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 moves that the company is making in terms of earnings and revenue growth, 
uh, maybe it is a candidate for replacement because there always is another company out there that might perform better than the company that you're holding. So there's nothing wrong with upgrading, but it doesn't necessarily mean that there's anything wrong with the stock. So patience is required uh, for a growth, uh, a growth approach. And certainly if you overpay for the stock, uh, if you buy it when the P ratio is too high, uh, you're going to be potentially waiting for a much longer time. Uh, if we do have a correction, the price is gonna come down at a greater percentage, uh, and then it's gonna take some time for the earnings to push that stock's price back up into a reasonable uh, range and put you back into the black. So again, our focus is not about trying to guess where the price is gonna be. Our focus is on the fundamental strength of the business, how they're competing relative to their peers, how are the profit margins holding up, what are the earnings and revenues uh, doing, are they expanding, are they growing, are they flat, are they holding steady, um, and uh, when we know what the, is going on fundamentally with the company, then we'll have confidence that the earnings uh, will definitely be driving price growth at some point in the future. My fourth tip is that uh, you should not sell because of analyst action. If you're putting too much stock in analyst ratings, uh, know that Wall Street analysts are notoriously short-term uh, oriented, um, and that's the opposite of what we are. So often if uh, analysts are uh, upgrading and downgrading stocks, they're in a completely different cycle than we are as long-term focused investors. These analysts are trying to figure out where the moves are gonna be in the next quarter, the next two quarters, maybe the next year, the next fiscal year, and we're out looking five years plus down the road. Uh, keep in mind that when a Wall Street broker makes upgrade and downgrade decisions, they're creating actionable advice for the brokers to reach out to clients and say, "We our analysts have just upgraded this stock. Our analysts have just set a target. We reached that target. It's time to sell that stock, lock in the profit. They're driving a business model that is great if you're a broker. Uh, it's not so great if you're an individual investor and your account is getting churned and you're making all sorts of additional transactions. So we don't put a whole lot of stock in analyst expectations in the near term. We will look and it is important to understand how the market is viewing a stock uh, relative to its performance over the next fiscal year. But in terms of upgrades and downgrades, uh, not nearly as important to our approach. And number five, don't hold on to your losers too long. Meyer Statman uh, from Santa Clara University has uh, written a lot about uh, financial psychology and the mindset of investors and traders as they focus on their money. He wrote in one of his uh, publications uh, this about uh, the uh, the the mental uh, uh, the mental approach. Uh, that blocks us from taking action uh, when we focus on the losses in our portfolio. He wrote that trading brings pride when decisions turn out well, but it brings regret when decisions do not turn out well. Investors try to avoid the pain of regret by avoiding the realization of losses, which is to say, if you think about a stock that you've got in your portfolio that you're holding at a significant loss, um, and you think about the possible outcomes of one, how would you feel if you sold the stock now and you locked in that 40% loss? Probably you would feel like you had made a mistake, like you were not very successful in investing, uh, that you had lost a lot of money. Um, th so there's a whole lot that's going on that's saying uh, this outcome is undesirable. And on the other hand, you think about, well, what if I simply hold that stock for a couple of more months? Maybe it could come back. Maybe I could lose less money or maybe I could actually make money uh, on this uh, transaction if I do nothing at all, if I continue to hold the stock. And so you weigh the two options. The one, the, on the one hand, feeling really terrible and the other, the faintest glimmer of hope that something will turn out well. And so this is why we become paralyzed because we get locked into this notion of as long as we hold on to the stock, maybe it'll come back. It will reward us for being such loyal investors and continuing to hold the stock while it has floundered, uh, which is, again, 
this is applying um, a, a, a feeling to something that is uh, uh, not responsive to uh, your uh, thoughts and prayers and hopes and dreams. Uh, it's just a stock. So um, we can counter that it, by uh, softening the pain of regret by selling a loser and a winner at the same time. Because when you sell a stock that you've made money on, think about the outcome there. You think you feel very successful. You feel satisfied. You feel confident. You feel like you've made a good decision. You have made money in your portfolio. So it's a very positive effect. And that positive feeling will outweigh the sense of loss by selling the losing stock uh, at the same time. So that's something that you can take uh, that you could uh, that you can balance out, and there's potentially some tax selling strategies to it that will help you as well. So uh, if you're in that situation where you're sitting on a stock that you really don't like, but you won't sell it because you think, well, maybe it'll come back, you're falling into this particular rabbit hole, and that's when you got to say, all right, it's time to disengage emotionally and just get rid of this particular stock, or a better strategy, find a replacement for that stock. And we'll talk about that strategy a little bit later. Number six, don't wait to get your money back. Uh, the, there is a cognitive bias known as the myth of memory that causes us to assume the markets have a memory. Uh, the markets and the stocks have a memory. They're rewarding us. Uh, but the market doesn't have any idea what you paid for a stock. A stock doesn't know what you paid for it. Uh, we're applying these human elements to uh, intangibles. It just doesn't work that way. If you sit around waiting to get your money back, um, you can uh, resolve uh, that once the stock, you know, stock is down 20%, you say, well, I can get back to even, uh, then I'll sell the stock. And then the falls a little bit more. Well, if I get back, you know, 25% or 75% of my investment, then I'll sell the stock. I'll wait for it to recover a little bit. And the stock can keep going down and down and down. So I can go all the way to zero um, with that kind of strategy. Um, you just set a lower set of goals every step along the way to delay the inevitable um, and negotiating with yourself about the sell decision. Uh, so if you fall find yourself falling into that trap as well well if we only got if we could get back if we could wait for it to go up another dollar or two um, the problem is not the stock in that case the problem is clearly you have made the sell decision in your head uh, uh, intellectually but emotionally you're not accepting it yet so you need to take action and uh, make that happen um, do sell to offset capital gains if you do have losses Again, this is another great way. If you've got a stock in your club portfolio that you're holding at a loss and you don't want to sell it because you don't want to hurt the feelings of the club member who brought it to you in the first place, they're kind of clinging on to the stock because they don't want their self-esteem to be lowered if the club decides to sell that stock. And so it gets very complicated very fast. If you can uh, if you have stock, a big winner in your portfolio, maybe it's a time at some point to say, well, we need to thin out some of our Apple stock, for instance, or some other stock that's performed very well. Um, if we sold X number of shares of Apple uh, and we sold all of the shares that were holding at a loss of this stock, uh, the, it'll wash out. There will be no capital gains um, or capital losses. Uh, and then we'll reduce our exposure to this uh, stock that's performed very well. That's a big portion of our portfolio, which is a good thing. Um, and um, we can revisit this at the next club meeting and say, if we want to repurchase the stock that we sold at a loss at this lower price, maybe it could come back again. We'll do another analysis. But uh, offsetting gains uh, with uh, losses can be a very smart way to disengage from a stock that you're holding that's not working out. Uh, the wash sale rule is very important. Um, the wash sale rule essentially says that you've got, to, uh, you can't repurchase a stock that you sold at a loss until the 31st day after the sale or else a portion, all or a portion of your capital loss uh, can be disallowed. So uh, that works great in terms of a club meeting because you can say, well, we'll pick it up at the next club meeting, we'll revisit it. Um, and many, I would suggest that if you have uh, in your club guidelines about buying and selling, if you ever sell a stock uh, purely to trigger the capital loss, something that clubs do uh, at the end of the year, um, to clean up their portfolios. Um, always let's revisit it 30 days later. Um, that can help 
the member who brought the stock in the first place, allow them to save face a little bit, but then it's a good exercise. Uh, and again, by and large, 30 days later, everyone has lost the taste for that stock. So you've postponed it, you've mitigated uh, the impact, the emotional impact of holding that stock, getting rid of that stock, and revisiting that stock, and you're looking at it from a new, quote, new perspective, and yeah, chances are very, very good that no one is gonna wanna buy that stock again for your club. Um, I suggest you do this around, before Thanksgiving, your November meeting, you start looking at your club portfolio. Um, if you, this year, uh, if you, you may have some losses that you can, uh, that, to have been triggered earlier in the year. Um, so you might look to sell some stocks that you're holding at gains. If you're selling a stock and you're holding it at gain, um, you can sell it um, um, uh, and repurchase it within 30 days. If you sell it again, you could buy it the next day if you wanted to. Um, so uh, that can be a really interesting strategy. Uh, if you've got losses this year going into November, sell those st uh, sell stocks that you've got that you're holding it again, uh, and then wait uh, and uh, potentially repurchase them. And at some later point, maybe when they come down a little bit in uh, price, uh, and that will offset your gains and losses. Uh, if you have more than uh, more losses than you have capital gains as an individual uh, taxpayer you can offset you can use three thousand dollars of capital uh, losses not gains uh, as it says here but you can use three thousand uh, dollars of capital losses uh, to offset ordinary income so that can reduce your AGI on your taxes so that is a good thing and if you have additional capital losses you can carry them forward uh, into future years on an indefinite basis. So uh, that can be very, uh, very, uh, you know, again, the Wall Street has a saying, nobody nobody ever got rich selling to take a tax loss. So don't get all excited about um, the losses in your portfolio, but uh, it, you do have some, uh, you can use these capital losses um, to offset other gains and to offset uh, ordinary income. So in your club, that would flow through at year end, the, the excess capital losses would flow through to each member and they would be able to, to reduce uh, their, their own capital gains or their uh, ordinary income. So um, we'll talk. We talk about this at year end. We can uh, we'll review it a little bit more uh, in depth. This sort of strategy of uh, matching gains and losses with a tax uh, tax selling strategy. Um, do sell on overvaluation. This is not something we have to worry about now. This is something um, prior to February you might have been able to take advantage of. Uh, there are four strikes you're out is the Joe Smith rule. Uh, Joe Smith was a long time better investing volunteer, founder of the Philadelphia chapter, um, and he had a four strikes you're out rule. So if a stock ever met all four of these strikes, it was uh, a very strong sell candidate if it met any uh, multiple number of them uh, it was a, a potential candidate for selling on overvaluation uh, his rules were if the relative value which is so if the p ratio is greater than 150 percent of uh, the average p e ratio um, that is very excessively valued and those p e ratios tend to regress back to closer to 100 uh, percent if the stock is in the sell zone if the upside downside ratio is less than one to one uh, and number four if the total return is unacceptably low which is defined as being less than the long-term bond or savings rate uh, somewhere around three or four percent uh, or your personal threshold, whatever it is. If you're holding a stock that has given you on the stock selection guide a potential total return of, of 4% a year for the next five years, uh, chances are that stock has performed very well um, or its potential uh, has declined significantly. Um, if you're only getting 4% a year from uh, a stock that you're owning, it might be much better off to replace that stock. So do sell on overvaluation. Keep this in mind after the market recovers a little more fully. Um, overvaluation can also occur due to fundamental decline. So you might see it, uh, there might be cases where the immediate uh, to midterm prospects for some companies on a fundamental basis are so poor that the, their total return over the next couple of years might be not enough to warrant holding those stocks, in which case they might be replacement candidates.
Um, an easy out if you have a stock that's got an adverse management change, uh, such as the departure of a company founder or dynamic CEO. Um, I'm always suspicious when several senior managers resign at the same time. Um, certainly, uh, uh, company officers who are arrested or indicted, uh, that can be a, a negative sign, something you, that uh, might cause you to say, yeah, it's probably time to uh, get rid of this particular company. Uh, our focus on quality for, in our approach means that companies that are towing the line, that are constantly being investigated, that have perhaps accounting practices that are that are really pushing the borders of what's acceptable, these are not generally the kinds of companies that you want to be holding in your portfolio because ultimately uh, they um, uh, they they're going to get caught up. Uh, and uh, the nefarious acts that their um, management may be undertaking. So uh, that's just a, a real simple, straightforward rule. Do sell if competitors are winning. Uh, a company that um, uh, that faces competition, whether it's indirect or direct, can often be thwarted. Uh, and so the pre-tax profit margins can give you ideas of stronger companies. Um, you know, look at a company, a publicly traded company like Toys R Us, for instance. Uh, Toys R Us uh, was the, the, was initially uh, sunk, uh, or the the the, the initial uh, uh, shots uh, to the Toys R Us ship were fired by Walmart uh, back in the 1990s when Walmart um, decided made a, a real decided decision to go into the toy selling business because Walmart could do it at the holidays. They could uh, reduce the patio furniture section and increase the toy section. Um, and Toys R Us, uh, um, you know, never thought that Walmart would be a threat. They thought their competition was the, the mall-based smaller stores like KB Toys and local toy sellers. Uh, and so Walmart became the number one toy seller in the country, while Toys R Us uh, wasn't really sure that video games were something that uh, it, their customers wanted. Um, so they made a bunch of missteps. Um, and so uh, again, don't get stuck thinking that a company's peers um, and uh, are within some sort of uh, uh, framework. And now Amazon is threatening, and e-commerce in general is threatening all sorts of bricks and mortar companies. But likewise, a lot of bricks and mortar com businesses are finding different bases for their, uh, their products and services. And uh, uh, so it's not always easy to find uh, who is threatening a particular company. But um, certainly, Looking at pre-tax profit margins will give you a sense. Companies that are being attacked and are unsuccessful may see their margins decline, and that's going to give you a sense of uh, the the inability of the company to drive earnings growth over the next couple of years. Uh, do sell if raw material costs are, are uncontrolled. Anytime you see companies that are struggling with the costs of raw materials or labor or energy or marketing, uh, those increased costs are going to cause the profit margins to decline uh, and that's going to lead to slowing or declining earnings per share. Again, going back to the 1980s and early 90s, Rubbermaid was one of the best, considered one of the best run businesses in America, but they didn't have a handle on the petrochemical based raw materials that they used. As those costs started to creep up, uh, Rubbermaid was unable to manage the increased costs, uh, attempted to, uh, attempted to uh, uh, raise the price of their products, but their single biggest customer down in Bentonville, Arkansas, Walmart, uh, declined to participate in this, this act of uh, price increases, which Walmart considered contrary to their culture. Uh, and uh, Walmart said, we have other businesses that are ready to provide uh, all of the stuff that, that Rubbermaid does. So if you can't, to deliver uh, the products at reasonable prices, then uh, don't deliver any products at all. And Rubbermaid said, no, 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 that's okay. Uh, but having a business that's uh, 
uh, where you're not making money selling your key product is not something that can be sustained for very long. So Rubbermaid ended uh, up getting bailed out uh, in a merger, which is really a takeover by Newell. Um, Newell uh, ultimately was not very successful at integrating, uh, kept the Rubbermaid brand name, but was never this, the, the company never reached the heights that Rubbermaid had uh, had reached earlier. So, uh, and that uh, it can all, uh, gets gets uh, uh, brought right back to raw material costs. So that's something very tangible that you can analyze. When you look at companies like Starbucks, uh, you know their raw material, uh, coffee beans, uh, is very critical. And so you can see uh, Wal uh, Starbucks' interest in coffee bean plantations around the globe and what they're doing to to make sure that their supply chain is uninterrupted if there is a deforestation in south america well then they've got suppliers in africa they've got suppliers in central america they have uh, contracts and hedging and all sorts of things in place in the past they've had periods where coffee beans uh, because of weather might have been the supplies might have been uh, reduced and costs go up uh, and Starbucks recognizes that uh, yes they can charge five or six dollars for a latte but eight or nine dollars might be a little excessive so uh, it's very important for them to be able to control the raw material costs so we can understand a lot of these and if we're seeing companies that are uh, that have uh, problems uh, with their profit margins um, that is a key warning sign and it might be worth replacing those businesses anytime when fundamentals are declining um, uh, in theory every time you buy a stock you understand what the likely drivers are for future growth uh, you should understand what the headwinds that may slow the future growth what are the tailwinds that are helping the future growth to grow to new levels uh, and so the fundamentals that affect those those headwinds and tailwinds uh, if the drivers that the, the key items that have factors that have been driving growth in the past uh, disappear well then this is time for you to take action and potentially consider uh, selling that particular stock on the part graph or uh, that better investing um, includes in its methodology um, it's focusing on the trailing 12 month so this is the rolling four quarter uh, figure of the pre-tax profit uh, growth, the percentage change in pre-tax profit uh, compared to the prior trailing 12-month period. Um, once you see deceleration for three to five consecutive quarters, then you, you, you're on to something that there is a trend in place uh, that may uh, uh, may cause future earnings to seriously contract. Maybe you've seen some fundamentals already, but that uh, almost always when you see three to five consecutive quarters where that Pre-tax profit is growing a little bit less, a little bit less, a little bit less, a little bit less, um, then that can be a, a sign that it's time to think about replacing that particular company. Whatever you do, don't downplay the downside. Uh, in his book, Enumeracy, John Allen Polos wrote that there's a general strong tendency to filter out the bad and the failed and to focus on the good and the successful. And again, another one of the cognitive biases that cause us to do as investors uh, to make bad decisions when, whenever it comes to money. We forget the failures and we remember the successes. We focus on the positive uh, and we filter out the negative. Uh, we want to, we believe uh, in, um, uh, we really like our Ford SUV. And so we buy the Ford stock, even though uh, their market share is declining precipitously uh, and uh, they, they're they no longer making cars, right? Um, which kind of hurts their market uh, to some degree, right? So if, whenever you're making decisions based on um, uh, a general filtering of the negative aspects, um, that can be a problem. So when you're looking at stocks, um, it's easy to, to hold on and say, well, let's just see what happens. Let's give it another quarter. But if we really want to focus on the downside, uh, really want to focus on the negative, uh, you might come to a different conclusion. And so we should be open to that.
Number 14, don't assume that you're smarter than everyone else. Sir Isaac Newton famously discovered gravity, but he never discovered the secret of how to make money in the stock market. Uh, and he was actually wiped out in a stock market crash in 1720. Uh, this is, uh, again, another cognitive bias that affects our decision to make buy and sell decisions. Individuals tend to overrate their own expertise, and that can cause you to uh, be late in taking action when you need to. Um, and so uh, often in a club, this, uh, this uh, comes to fruition when you're discussing a, a pharmaceutical stock and you immediately turn to the doctor in your club and ask them for a perspective. Uh, they may not have a lot of a special expertise in cardiovascular drugs because they're a pediatrician and it's not their realm, but because now a dozen people are looking at them as an expert and they wanna feel uh, like they're contributing, they may provide an opinion and everyone holds that opinion up uh, and uh, it might be contrary to the research you would do from a, a, a an unbiased perspective if you were to evaluate the business. So we tend, we want to avoid uh, our own biases uh, and the biases that we apply to the information and people around us. Um, if you have um, members in your club who are fully withdrawing, uh, and this is only for full member withdrawals. First of all, you can consider transferring appreciated stock, stock that has gone up in price. Uh, there's no downside to the member. There's no downside to the club. Uh, it's a way of postponing the capital gains for the remaining members that would have incurred if you had sold them. You don't avoid the capital gains. You merely postpone them. It's a transaction that the accounting software supports. It's supported by IRS regulations. There's nothing... Uh, it's not a loophole. It has to do with ensuring the ongoing operation of an investing uh, partnership or a partnership in general. So for full withdrawals, that can be a great way to, to uh, get rid of stocks in your club. If another, um, uh, for a full withdrawal, another way to get rid of stock uh, in your club, if you've got a loser, um, sell that stock, uh, capture the capital loss. It's an easy out for the club. You get rid of the stock that nobody really likes anyway, but you're not selling it because of uh, the your your astute analysis of the potential of the business. Uh, you're selling it because you needed to raise cash to pay off a withdrawal. And so the the member who brought the club to the, the stock to the club's attention gets to save face. Now for partial withdrawals. Um, you never transfer stock, uh, and that can be a good opportunity to sell depreciated stock uh, or appreciated stock, sell stock as well. But whatever you do, uh, the uh, full withdrawal uh, rules are in uh, place. We've talked about them uh, in our webinar we did a couple of months ago on member withdrawals, and I'll point to on my iClub, the withdrawal scenario calculator, which will walk you through this better than I can explain it right now in limited time uh, uh, and you can use this um, to just to, to run through it to understand it if a member wants to do a full withdrawal or a partial withdrawal what are the best ways to pay them off by transferring shares selling stocks and we'll look at the the tool looks at your current portfolio your embedded capital gains and losses and make suggestions and ranks um, the uh, scenarios in order of preference to maximize the benefit for the members and for the club. Uh, but I just point that out because uh, a lot of clubs get a lot very anxious when a member withdraws because, oh, now we've got to raise cash and we try to get everybody to contribute a little extra money. And then uh, often the better perspective is to say, well, yes, we have a member withdrawing. Yes, we have stocks in the club's portfolio that we're not very happy with that are not performing well. Maybe it's time to sell those stocks, capture the loss, pay, use the cash to pay off the withdrawal, and then in 30 days, look at revisiting when we've got, or 30 days later, at some point when we've got more cash, we can look at those companies again and look at buying them at the lower price. If it still makes sense, then it's a win-win-win all the way around for the departing member, for the club, uh, from a tax perspective and a fundamental perspective. Uh, so I don't look at withdrawals as being uh, a, the dire 
uh, situation that many clubs uh, seem to to focus uh, and to per perceive them as. Uh, and finally, number 16, if you are really uncertain about a stock's prospects, why are you holding it? Uh, so uh, that is um, should be your over over arching rule of thumb. If everyone in the club is uncertain about a company's prospects, when there's a lack of certainty, when things may turn around, when it seems like the company might be doing be able to do okay, but it's been a couple of quarters of really abysmal performance, there it's obvious there's a, a an aura of uncertainty around it. Uh, in those cases, I would suggest, again, not selling the stock, but uh, the nomenclature that I use is AFC, available for clash, cash. If you have stocks that you own, you've lost confidence in them, you're not quite sure what to do, uh, you mark them AFC. You know, can put the write it on the on the valuation statement at the club meeting. AFC um, club vote decides. Yes, the consensus is if we can find a better stock, let's use the cash from selling this stock and buy a better stock, and we'll be happier that way. And that way, uh, you are planting the seed of the eventual sell decision. But you're not selling. You're not saying, oh, you know. We're not going to take action right away. We're not going to take action and sit on cash, uh, for instance, but we're going to go try to find some better opportunities. Uh, if we find a better opportunity, then we're going to replace the stock. And that leads me to my uh, uh, my uh, my final uh, uh, method methodology related to selling that I'm going to share with you uh, right now that we might consider banishing sell from our portfolio uh, vocabulary, our portfolio management vocabulary. And instead of selling, it, let's think instead about replacing stocks or upgrading our portfolio. Um, what can we do to upgrade our portfolio? Um, the stock is not working out very well. Uh, what, uh, do we have any ideas for stocks that we could use to replace it? This is a very different conversation than this stock has just been a real dog. Let's sell it. It's a loser. We're, we're losing so much money. Um, let's just sell that stock and be done with it. That's a very negative conversation to be having. But on the other hand, we say, well, let's see. Can we find uh, another stock that we like better, that we could replace this stock that will help our entire portfolio to perform better? Now we're thinking in terms of a positive uh, approach to our portfolio management methodology. So if we can remove underperformers by swapping them for higher quality, higher total return stocks. And we can do this on a, on a regular basis. If stocks aren't working out, let's find something better uh, that does have better prospects in the midterm uh, as well as the long term. Let's not be always just sitting around waiting for things to happen. If the stock is not performing as we expected, let's take action and try to find replacements. And this is why it's very important that we're constantly on the lookout for opportunities to improve the portfolio. We, we've got our watch list in, in place. We have our ideas of companies that we would buy if the PE ratio was a little bit less than it is right now. We're constantly feeding the, from the portfolio from the bottom up. We're looking for the best opportunities. And if we find a great stock and everyone goes, wow, this looks like a really good opportunity. Oh, we don't have any cash this month. I guarantee you all of you in your club have stocks that you're holding that are not uh, that are that are not performing up to your expectations. And when someone has an idea and does the analysis and says this stock really looks like a good candidate, that's the time when you start thinking about replacing one stock with another. Yes, we pay attention to our portfolio diversification, our small, large, mid-sized company exposure, our sector and industry uh, allocations within the portfolio. But at the end of the day, if you have the opportunity to buy um, a, a really great run business at a really reasonable price, um, that overrides those portfolio diversification, uh, many of those portfolio diversification considerations. Not necessarily all of them, I understand, but on the other hand, if we got that opportunity to buy a company um, that's been on your watch list that is now presenting at a reasonable price, those are the types of opportunities we should be taking advantage of as we go. Well, so that brings us to the end of our 
Uh, just about a, a minute left in our, uh, our, our time allotted tonight. Uh, I see a couple of questions, but uh, our team has been um, answering them in the back office. Uh, Stuart says, why not transfer stock? Again, the, the rules are, are different for transferring stocks in a withdrawal, whether it's a full withdrawal or a partial withdrawal. Um, it makes a difference whether you transfer stock or whether it's better to sell the stock. <clears throat> um, so uh, there are a bunch of different scenarios there. I would suggest you take a look at the tool, um, at the My iClub uh, withdrawal scenario calculator, which is in the people section. You can find it there. It's in the uh, uh, member withdrawal wizard. You can find a link to it there. Uh, and that will help you identify the right opportunities. It explains it all, and there's a link to a flow sheet that will help you, again, walk through the best uh, the best applications of the transfer versus sell um, a stock, depending on the type of withdrawal and the club's preferences. Hey, Doug? Yes, Russell. Uh, I, I answered Christian's question about uh, adding to a losing position to lower your uh, you know, average cost, uh, but I think people would be interested in your perspective on that. Oh, let's see. Uh, uh, let me. Okay, I see it there. Yep. Uh, Christian says, "What if you have losers and you keep buying lower, uh, buying stocks to lower the average cost?" Uh, to the stock to eventually sell it and try to break even. Um, yeah, so the concept is uh, averaging down, um, that you own a stock, you own a position, and it's now it's selling at a lower price. And so um, you decide, well, if it was a great stock at $30, at $25, it must be a fabulous stock. Um, and so you decide to, to add some more shares at $25. And then it goes to $20. You think, well, if it was a great stock at $30 and a fabulous stock at $25, and now here it is at $20, um, it can, you know, this must be one of the best opportunities we're going to have in our lifetime to buy this stock. And so you buy some more shares. And so your, you know, your average price keeps coming down as you, uh, as you go. Um, averaging down can, can work. Um, the, the problem often is that stocks that see those kind of sudden price declines, um, <clears throat> where they're coming down 20, 30 uh, percent, uh, if, you know, again, outside of a bear market or market correction, uh, there's, they're being driven by some sort of, some, some fundamental issues, perhaps, uh, that are causing the price to come down. Um, or at the very least, the market perception that this stock's prospects for future uh, capital appreciation and growth are diminished. And so the market is uh, causing that, uh, the, that stock's multiple to decline, that price to come down. Um, and so in those types of situations, uh, yes, occasionally these can be really great opportunities because the market's herd mentality often uh, is often running in whatever direction. The momentum takes it down, the stock is going down, uh, and uh, the, from, from your perspective, the metrics um, all seem to indicate that, yeah, well, um, this stock was growing at 30%, now it's only growing at 20%, uh, and the PE is 18. It just looks like, you know, because the market sold it off because they were disappointed that it wasn't going to grow at 30%. What we know as long-term focused investors that 30% growth is not really sustainable over the long term. So if we can buy it at a, at a, 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 a still at a, a relatively attractive PE ratio when it's growing at 20%, that can make a whole lot of sense. Um, the risk that comes with this strategy is that the market, uh, there's a saying that Wall Street is a short street with a long memory. Um, and uh, that is to say that um, for the, the interim, the next one to two years, there may be sort of a stigma about this company, no matter how well it performs, there are going to be some people, some man, fund managers or traders who are going to say, yeah, but see, you know, that company, boy, <clears throat> that really tanked uh, in the first quarter of uh, 2019. And, uh, you know, growth has just been nowhere near where it was before then. And again, this is, uh, it's true. 
uh, but it just has no reflection on reality, but they remember it went down, and so they tend to avoid it. Um, if you think about the large swath of uh, of mutual fund man managers and head fund managers and brokers who are managing customers' uh, positions, stocks that have run into problems um, often become tainted, for lack of a better word, because of their association with with um, uh, underperformance. Uh, because the the you know if you were a broker advising a client and this stock fell 30%, no amount of explanation of the fundamental perspective and the potential future growth from this point is going to mitigate the customer frustration that you lost 30%, you lost them 30% in this particular position, right? And so it takes a very rare sort of broker advisor slash customer combination to recognize the pure fundamentals of a uh, fundamental perspective and to take advantage of it. And so the, the bottom line, I'm rambling on a little bit, the bottom line is that often in those types of cases, you have to be, you have to watch out because the next year or two, those stocks may, may not uh, deliver um, the midterm growth that just will make you second guess your decision and kind of make you sit around uh, waiting for uh, something that might be very long in coming. So as long as you're aware that companies that um, that uh, see uh, that undergo uh, a transition phase uh, from uh, you know a rocket. Uh, rocket launch growth rate um, to something a little more stable over the long term. There's a period of you know 12 to 24 months where the market uh, still remembers uh, and uh, won't let the stock's price go up. And so you, you can see this kind of on a 10-year trajectory. You might see you know companies that uh, where the the growth flattens that out, flattens out, and the price. Um, uh, plummets and then it remains at that lower level, um, uh, irregardless of the the fundamentals of the business. Uh, so uh, I would caution against too much putting too much stock in the averaging down concept. Again, uh, this goes. Um, uh, I've been developing some thoughts that we'll address in a future webinar about uh, kind of matching your risk uh, tolerance level. Uh, whether you're you're very aggressive and tolerant and and you can truly be a long-term focused investor versus someone with a middle range and someone who's more risk adverse um, and figuring out kind of w which of these categories um, this that type of strategy fits into that's definitely something for someone who's a little more aggressive um, and can tolerate being ignored, having that stock be ignored by the broader market over uh, the midterm, which I define as you know one to three years down the road. Um, and again, our focus is not on the one to three year period, but it's very depressing to have a stock on in your portfolio that you're holding for 24, 30, 36 months that's not doing anything. Uh, even if the fundamentals are strong, it ha ha causes you to second guess yourself and uh, again, it's not contributing to the forward trajectory of your portfolio, and that can be frustrating too. Um, so, uh, so that's my that that's my thought a process on uh, this whole concept of averaging down. All right, well, uh, we're going to wrap it up there. Thanks for sticking with me tonight. Thanks, Russell and Sean in the back office. Uh, we'll look forward to seeing you at our next Investment Club webinar, uh, which will be on the second Tuesday of June 2020. Uh, we'll look forward to seeing you there. Uh, we've got a lot of uh, further webinars. Uh, the Virtual Better Investing National uh, Convention will be happening in June as well. I'll be kicking that off on the first night of those presentations. So if you are a Better Investing member, uh, check uh, those uh, dates and make sure you, you sign up for uh, that, those four nights of uh, educational presentations that will help you navigate uh, the current market uh, with a little more information and a sense of uh, what may come. Until then, we'll see you next time.